Father Paul Robinson presents his Marian Instructional Conferences, 2013. Lecture 9. Interior Practice of the Devotion. The Image of a Slave. Welcome to this ninth of our series of conferences on St. Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort's True Devotion to Mary. Now we have seen the reasons for and the benefits from practicing St. Louis True Devotion. And now we come to actually how it is performed. So we know from the past conferences that St. Louis was able to penetrate deeply into the designs of God's infinite wisdom. This is in fact St. Louis' purpose, to penetrate this wisdom of God from all eternity for the accomplishment of our redemption and sanctification. St. Louis was able to see very clearly in what way God decided to come to us. And based on this penetration that he has into God's plan, he is able to figure out the very best way for men themselves to unite with God. If we can imagine a path from God to man, a path by which God comes to man through Our Lady. And now we start up on the, on the opposite path, the path leading from man to God. And again, as St. Louis pointed out to us, the path on the right side from God to man, so too he's going to point out to us the proper path on the left side from man to God. And effectively what he's going to tell us is that we must follow the exact same path. We must use the path that God has established. We must follow God's way. Now I must firstly point out that the essence of this devotion is the interior dispositions that it is supposed to form in us. In other words, the primary purpose of the devotion is to change us on the inside. It seeks to change our orientation towards God, the way that we approach Him. It seeks to change the attitude that we have when we perform our daily activities and the way that we, we react to things that happen to us from the outside. And really, only those who are able to accomplish this internal change are fully able to practice this devotion. And the key part of this interior change is a disposition of total dependence upon Our Lady. This is the disposition above all that we wish to form in practicing this devotion. Now St. Louis uses two images to help us understand this disposition. The fact that he uses two indicates to us that there is no one image that indicates perfectly this disposition of total dependence on Our Lady. The first image is that of a slave, and that's the image that we will speak about in this lecture. And the second image is that of a child, which we will speak about in the following lecture. So St. Louis saw that if God the Holy Trinity placed itself in dependence on Our Lady for the work of our salvation, and our Lord in His humanity annihilated Himself and in a sense enslaved Himself to Our Lady, then the very best way for us to unite ourselves with God is to place ourselves in dependence on Our Lady and even enslave ourselves to her. Hence the image of the slave and this total enslavement to Our Lady. Now back in Conference 3, I quoted St. Louis's formula of consecration to Our Lady wherein he's speaking to our Lord and he says, I give thee thanks for that thou hast annihilated thyself, taking the form of a slave, in order to rescue me from the cruel slavery of the devil. I praise and glorify thee for that thou hast been pleased to submit thyself to Mary, thy holy mother, in all things. So in the mind of St. Louis, the picture of God becoming a microscopic fetus in the womb of one of his creatures is quite simply a picture of a self-annihilation. It's also a picture of slavery in that a child in a womb has no physical freedom, being in total physical dependence on its mother. It cannot move where it wants to move. It cannot go where it wants to go but it's simply shut up in that womb. And this 
language, this very bold language of, of annihilation, of slavery, and so on, is not a language that St. Louis makes up. In fact, he takes it from St. Paul, who says in Philippians 2, 7, that our Lord annihilated himself, taking the form of a slave. And in the very same passage, St. Paul invites us to have the same mind as Jesus Christ. In other words, to imitate this example that our Lord sets us in annihilating himself in taking the form of a slave. And so as our Lord became a loving slave to Our Lady for our sakes, so too we must become her loving slave in order to most perfectly render to our Lord the love that we owe him. This is part of our showing him proper homage and proper love by this most perfect imitation of his own behavior while he was here on earth. To do this we have to give ourselves totally over to Our Lady such that absolutely nothing remains for ourselves. We must become her complete possession and to accomplish this there is no better means than voluntary enslavement. But this word slave today is quite a shocking one and it's looked upon with total horror. And the reason is really because of the liberalism that reigns in the modern world which makes absolute freedom to be the highest good such that a man can do whatever he wants whenever he wants at all times at all places. That's the ideal for the modern world. This perspective sees any subjection at all to be intrinsically evil. And this includes, of course, subjection to the law of God and even subjection to the laws of our own human nature. And so it is that the modern world claims for women the right to destroy their own children in their wombs against the laws of their own maternal nature. It claims that homosexuals have the right to make use of people of the same sex against the nature of their own gender. And it even claims that people have the right to change that gender against the law of their own created existence. All of these supposed freedoms are actual slaveries, as is true for all sin. Every sin is a certain slavery in that it binds us to a certain way of behaving such that very quickly we lose control of ourselves. We lose the ability to choose. Now I'm not saying, and St. Louis is certainly not saying, that slavery as it used to be practiced among the Romans and among certain slave-possessing civilizations we're not saying that this is a good thing. However, we are saying that enslaving ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through Our Lady is a very good thing. And that's going to require a certain denial of our own wills. It's going to require subjection. And subjection is not only not wrong in some cases, in some cases it's even our greatest good. St. Louis points out that men, in fact, have no choice but to be slaves. Men, we lost our right to heaven with original sin, and because of that, we became slaves of original sin and of the devil. As slaves, we could not free ourselves from this dominion of sin and the devil over us. And so our Lord Jesus Christ came and purchased us from the devil by his death on the cross. We do not belong to ourselves, says St. Louis in paragraph 68 of his work, but are entirely his, as his members and his slaves, whom he has bought at an infinitely dear price, the price of all his blood. Before baptism we belong to the devil as his slaves, but baptism has made us true slaves of Jesus Christ, who have no right to live, to work, or to die except to bring forth fruit for that God-man, to glorify him in our bodies and to let him reign in our souls, because we are his conquest, his acquired people, and his inheritance. 
And so the fact is that we are either a slave of Christ or we are the slave of the devil. There is really no third possibility. We have to choose one or the other. Either we are going to be subject to the dominion of sin and hence be enslaved to the devil, or we going, we're going to enable ourselves to profit from the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ and we will come completely under His dominion. There's no third possibility. Now because we have been purchased by our Lord Jesus Christ and we are His slaves, we owe Him wages. For St. Louis, the modern world to the contrary, it's obvious that our Lord has rights over us and that we totally belong to Him. And He sort of asks us how we are going to pay our dues. In what frame of mind are we going to render our service to our Master, our Lord? And He appeals to us not to render this service as fearful or as servile slaves or some sort of mercenary servants looking for a reward, but to serve Him as loving and voluntary slaves. He says that those who are in the world, we even find among them voluntary slaves, men who willingly subject themselves to others and even totally subject themselves to others. And so He says to us that we must willingly subject ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, for St. Louis, the most honorable title that he can assume in this life is that of a slave of Jesus and Mary. He wants nothing to do with his modern pseudo-freedom, which is only a liberty to destroy oneself. The liberty to do sin, to do whatever you want, is only a liberty insofar as you're able to destroy yourself when instead of doing what's best for you. And so St. Louis glories in the opportunity to annihilate himself by a total slavery to Jesus and Mary. There is nothing among men, he says in paragraph 72, which makes us belong to another more than slavery. There is nothing among Christians which makes us more absolutely belong to Jesus Christ and His Holy Mother than the slavery of the will, according to the example of Jesus Christ Himself, who took on Himself the form of a slave for love of us, and also according to the example of the Holy Virgin, who called herself the servant and the slave of the Lord. The Apostle calls himself, as by a title of honor, the slave of Christ, and Christians are often so called in Holy Scripture. And so we not only throw off this false notion that is present in the modern world of liberty, but we embrace wholeheartedly subjection. We do not want to be free. We want to be slaves, quite simply. But a question may arise as to whether we are to be a slave of Jesus or a slave of Mary. And the answer is quite simply both. Those who belong to Christ the King also belong to Our Lady the Queen. His slaves are her slaves because of the fact that she was the inseparable companion of the work of the redemption whereby He bought us. Those who belong to the new Adam necessarily belong to the new Eve. Those who are incorporated in our, on our Lord Jesus Christ are necessarily incorporated into Our Lady as well, though in a different way. It's because of this that St. Louis says in paragraph 75, We may call ourselves and make ourselves the loving slaves of the Most Holy Virgin in order to be by that very means the more perfectly the slaves of Jesus Christ. Our Blessed Lady is the means our Lord made use of to come to us. She is also the means which we must make use of to go to Him. For she is not like all other creatures, who, if we should attach ourselves to them, might rather draw us away from God than draw us near Him. The strongest inclination of Mary is to unite us to Jesus Christ, her Son. 
and the strongest incl inclination of the Son is that we should come to Him through His Holy Mother. It is to honor and please Him, just as it would be to do honor and pleasure to a king, to become more perfectly His subject and His slave by making ourselves the slaves of the Queen. And so, we must give ourselves over to Jesus Christ as entirely as possible. And there is no better way of doing this than then by placing ourselves in total dependence on Our Lady. If we wish to embrace this slavery, we must surrender everything. We may say that the primary purpose of the image of slavery is to indicate the totality of our consecration to Our Lady. St. Louis brings home the utter completeness of this act by making a comparison between servants, which only give partially, and slaves, which give everything. He makes five different comparisons between these two different roles. He points out that a servant retains some possessions of his own that he has or will have, while a slave has to surrender all that he has or will have to his master without exception. So the slave has no property whatsoever. A servant requires a wage or a payment for his services. While a slave, no matter how much work he does, he gets no payment whatsoever, no reimbursement, no reward. A servant can leave or stop working whenever he wants. Effectively, he has a job. He just has a, a career, and so he can quit and take other employment when he wills. Whereas a slave has no right to ever leave. A servant, fourthly, has his life in his own hands. Whereas the slave has his life in the hands of his master. St. Louis refers to the ancient Roman civilizations wherein you had the patri familias, which was the head of the family, who had the power of life and death over his subordinates. He could put a slave to death without any recrimination coming upon him on behalf of the Roman law. The final comparison between a servant and a slave is that the servant works for only a certain period of time, whereas the slave works for life. And while not all of these comparisons or these characteristics of the slave are going to apply to us as slaves of Our Lady, such as the fact that we will get some reward, certainly, from Our Lady and from Our Lord, yet this comparison helps us understand to what degree we must try to give ourselves so completely that we no longer consider ourselves as having our life in our own hands. We must not be looking for any reward, for any payment to be given. We must consider this as being true for the rest of our lives. And the fact that once we make this consecration, we will have no right to rescind it, no right to demand anything of our Lord and Our Lady. This is the proper attitude that we would have in making this consecration. Because, in fact, this giving of ourselves is accomplished by an act of total consecration, a sort of contract between us and our Lord and Our Lady. A consecration, this word indicates a setting aside of some created thing for sacred purposes. In St. Louis' formula of consecration, which I have quoted before in these conferences, he has us set aside everything that we have in the order of nature and in the order of grace for the use of Our Lady. And by the order of nature, we mean everything that pertains to us on the level of our humanity. Whereas the order of grace concerns all of those possessions that we have that transcend this earth, that have some supernatural value. 
And so in the act of consecration, we give to Our Lady, firstly, our body, with all of its senses and its members. Secondly, we give our soul with all of its powers. You have in your soul the intellect, the will, the memory, the imagination, your passions. So we give all of that as well to Our Lady. And once we've given body and soul, we give her our whole human nature. We also give our exterior goods, present and future, all that we have right now, all that we will have in the future. And by these exterior goods, we give them over to her in the sense that we consider them as really her possessions, and we only use them with her in mind. And then lastly, we give away even our interior and spiritual goods, namely our merits, our virtues, all of our good works. And St. Louis points out that even in the vows of religion, for those who are consecrated to God in the religious life, they do not even give away so much. They do not give away their spiritual goods. On the subject of the spiritual goods, St. Louis points out that there are two different types of value that we get from our supernatural good works. First of all, there's something called the satisfactory value. This is payment for sin. So we perform some sort of good work on the supernatural level and we pay for whatever sins we may have committed in the past or we may also gain a new grace for the future. And we give these away by this consecration. We give them to our Lord to use for those who need it and for the greater glory of God. A second value coming from our supernatural good works is what's called the meritorious value. This is a good work that obtains for us grace and eternal glory. Every single one of us, if we have the grace to make it to heaven, we will be placed at a certain position in heaven, at a certain rank. We will be able to participate in the vision of God to a certain degree, depending on this merit. And so this merit as well, we give away to our Lord by this consecration. We give it to Him to preserve, augment, and embellish. In a sense, we confide it to Him, trusting that by our total giving away of, these, of this value, this meritorious value, we will get much more in return while at the same time we do not count, we do not make any sort of reckoning of how much we're going to get from this consecration, such that we go into the consecration really not expecting anything for ourselves. This is the proper attitude. And so by the consecration we give away absolutely everything that we could give away. There is nothing left that we could give. And having given away everything, we are no longer able to dispose of the value of any of our good actions. Everything belongs to Our Lady. We can't say to her, no, you owe me for this. You need to do this with my good works. You need to perform this action or that action on my behalf. We've given everything to her. She does with it what she wants. And so by this consecration, we give ourselves totally to Jesus Christ as our final end, but through Our Lady as the most perfect means of uniting with, with Him. We try to dedicate our thoughts, our words, our actions, our sufferings, every hour of our life, whether we be waking or whether we be sleeping, whether we are conscious or not conscious, everything we give over to Jesus and Mary by the offering of slavery. Since He has given us all, we seek to give Him all in return. And we glory in that giving, we glory in that slavery, that total subjection to Him through His Mother. Obviously, in normal human activity, such a consecration 
would quite simply be madness. The reason is that there is no one on this earth that we can trust completely so as to surrender everything that we have to them. However, if we have understood the goodness of our Lord and our Lady, not only is this consecration not madness, but it is in fact profoundly wise, supernaturally wise, because our Lord and our Lady are much more trustworthy than we ourselves are. We could confide on our own powers, we could trust in ourselves to pave our way to heaven and to struggle and to conquer heaven on our own power. But this would not be wise. This would be perhaps humanly wise, where we feel like we can do everything on our own and we only use people insofar as we need them, but we are very careful not to put ourselves in a disadvantageous position with respect to them. Well, here we do the exact opposite. We put ourselves in a totally disadvantageous position with respect to our Lord and Our Lady. We put ourselves totally at their mercy. We give ourselves completely to them, subjecting ourselves as completely as possible, leaving nothing for ourselves. We can imagine Our Lady standing at the bottom of a cliff and encouraging us to jump into our arms. We need to get down to the bottom of the cliff. We could trust ourselves, get a rope, and try to get down there. But in this consecration, we do not hesitate. We close our eyes and we just jump. We leave the rest to Our Lady. Now, St. Louis, understanding how such a consecration can be a formidable act, it's an act of consequence. He puts forward some objections that are made by those who do not have a total trust in Our Lady. Someone might say, for instance, that if I make this consecration, I will not be able to help my parents, my friends, and my benefactors. I'm going to be confiding everything to Our Lady. She's going to do with it what she wills, and so she may not be using it for my friends and family and those who I pray for. St. Louis answers that these people could not possibly suffer from the fact that we reserve and consecrate ourselves entirely to Our Lady. He says that in fact we should pray with all the more confidence for others, both living and dead, and that having given all to Our Lady, we are more sure of having our prayers answered through her. She, quite simply, will never be outdone in gratitude. We should consider our spiritual life as working exactly the same way it did before the consecration, after the consecration is made. It's just that now everything goes through Our Lady, and we have this special relationship with her, this special contract to her. We entrust to her all of our spiritual needs and intentions, and we expect her motherly care because of her, our confidence in her goodness. We trust that because we've given everything to her, she will take care of our interests as if they were her own. A second objection is that by making this consecration, we would have to suffer a long time in purgatory because we're no longer paying for our own sins. We've taken that satisfactory value of our good works and we've entrusted it to Our Lady. And we say to her, do with it what you will, and we're no longer working to pay for our own sins. St. Louis simply says, is it possible for a soul to be punished more hereafter because it was more generous and disinterested here below? Certainly he does not th think so. A last objection that is not treated directly by St. Louis, but is certainly treated indirectly, is someone who would say, I feel myself totally unworthy to make this consecration. What if I do the consecration and then I do not live up to it? Well, we must understand that this is not a devotion that requires a certain holiness in order for it to be practiced. Rather, it is a great means to achieve holiness. 
and thus our own perception of our weakness should move us all the more to make the consecration rather than deter us from it. We want to make the consecration in order to become holier and not expect ourselves to have a certain level of holiness before making the consecration. And so, in the course of this lecture, we have seen that this true devotion to, to Mary is practiced primarily on the interior by a formation of an attitude of total dependence on Our Lady. And one aspect of this dependence is the enslavement of ourselves to Jesus Christ through Our Lady, whereby we give away all that we have in the order of nature and in the order of grace through a special act of consecration. In the next lecture, we will consider a second disposition of this dependence, which is that of a child towards its mother.